There's too much skin on that piece, eh, Gary? Or peel. There, do you want to put it over here on this piece? And I'll take, let's save that there. There's another piece, not so much skin, not so much peel. Oh. Your fingernails are getting long again, eh? Yeah, but... stretches when she was well and when she was well she was just on top of the world I mean she just enjoyed having company over she enjoyed making tea having cookies she she was a good baker she did preserves she was a good cook but then she would have episodes where she was down and she was depressed right mom and dad were having their 50th wedding anniversary my parents were both very Christian people and um, they loved the Lord and it was just a lovely time. So that was 1994 and that was the last year my mother was well. It's really been sad because you see your mother go from sick off and on, yes, but she would be well again and she would go back to a normal life doing the cooking, the cleaning and having friends over and she just loved having her family over any time to now all of a sudden she's hospitalized. We don't know a whole lot about Philho's story. He has been in for many, many years. He has very few family members. He's 94, so most of them are gone as it is. He did have some brothers. I don't think he had any sisters, and his parents are obviously gone. So he's been pretty much on his own. To him, the hospital staff is his family because that is who he sees every day and who takes care of him. We never know each day what's going to happen. Uh, obviously right now he's sleepy. Sometimes it's tears, sometimes it's major laughter. Every single day with him is different. Well, we're gonna talk about you. No, that's not too bad because I can run pretty fast. I know you can run fast. You used to run long distance. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. That I can run a lot of no, no. You used to run kilometers and kilometers. When he retired, he started a tree business um, because he was bored. And he was cutting trees for everybody anyway. We'd work long days, and then when we were done, we were pretty sore. He always managed to find enough strength to get the rest of the equipment out. I'd be done. I'd be laying on the grass <laughs> wondering if I was alive or dead. But I think he saw changes in himself before that's, that's we noticed really them. Mm -hmm. And I think they agitated him, and I think they worried him. His nightmares were terrible. He had chronic nightmares. So he would stay in the room, and we would call him and wake him up and tell him, Dad, you're dreaming. Dad, you're dreaming. And then when we would open the door, his hands would be all cut up. I'd take him for stitches a few times. Um, 
But the nightmares were just terrible. It was hard on us, but I mean, he was going through this. And he was, he was coming in and out. Realizing that he was losing himself. And that was hard. You ready to have some lunch, mm. Andy? Good. Here. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello, your eyes are open. This is good. His last two years on the police force, he was the deputy chief. And he retired at 55, and at 57, this horrible disease took a hold of him. So we've kind of been living with this slowly since he was 57. We had a lake place, a trailer, and I'd say to him, oh, I think I slammed that door too hard. Could you go to the shed and get a screwdriver and, and bring that in and fix that door? So he'd say, okay, hon, and he'd go out to the shed and he'd come back five minutes later, no screwdriver, and he'd sit down and he'd shove in one of his favorite John Wayne movies. So I'd go out to the, I call it the Mink Lake room, and I'd say, "Hun, are you gonna fix this covered door for me? And he'd say, well, why didn't you ask me? And that, to me, was a warning signal. I love you. That's what I miss, too. Um, a year ago, when I'd say, I love you, he'd say, I love you back. Um, he doesn't know the odd time he might put those words together, but not very often. I think he, he does love me, but he can't put it into words. He loved teaching. He, he taught for uh, almost 35 years when he retired. In 1990, Gary's mother got Alzheimer's. And we had known that her father had had it and one of her brothers had it. Oh, so we knew, and Gary knew in 99, he said, I, you know, he always complained about not being able to remember. And I, he often didn't know people's names. And I said, that, well, that's, you know, that's pretty usual. But then everything happened really fast. And Gary was admitted in 2011. You know, some days he has lots of fun still. He loves to dance, the music days. I always come for those days because uh, I, I like to participate in them. Um, uh, some days he's, he, well, you know, some days he sleeps, some days he's cranky. And I, I do find it difficult. It's, it's our life and I guess, we can still live, and uh, it's not always easy to know what to do. Um, you know, other than one step at a time, it, I don't know. I don't have the answers exactly. It's really difficult to sometimes be able to wrap your head around the fact that all of these changes are occurring. There is no predictability. Their mind is failing them, and. This can be extremely disheartening to them and to their family members because we have a picture of wellness. And when you start to care for your loved one, the elderly patient, you get to see that they are getting older. When we think about providing care in a timely way, one of the most important things is gentle care. What do they want? How can we promote the uh, physiological and psychological comfort? Our patients are our greatest teachers. They teach us about love and fortitude and determination and grace under fire. We can learn that positive change is possible. The family is uh, of paramount importance. Often uh, people who are suffering from dementia or other types of degenerative uh, mental illness start to have difficulty uh, remembering certain things or interpreting their environment, but one of the things that stays with them the longest is that recognition of familiar faces and particularly family. You're just a sweet woman, right? Are you a sweet lady? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
I think people feel that the person is gone. And in fact, the person isn't gone. They've lost parts of themselves in many ways, but there are areas that we can still connect with. There is joy that we can evoke from interactions with them. I believe certainly that we that we see that connection between family and, and patients. So their, their role in visiting and assisting us with their care and informing us about who the person was and how they've changed and how they are now is extremely important to help us care for them as well. The Photo Voice Project is such an exciting opportunity. In Seniors Mental Health, we strive to have a person-centered approach. If an illness has developed later in life, for example dementia, that person has changed cognitively and may no longer be able to express verbally the things that are important to them. Knowing these things helps us to connect with the person, allows us to honour who they are and points us to how to meaningfully engage the person. Photo Voice allows these adults to say, I'm important, I have a place in this community. Let me tell you how I matter, let me tell you my story. Nothing like this before in my life. I ain't seen nothing like this before in my life. I ain't seen nothing like this before in my life.